Hello. Well, you have me for a second time today, hopefully. But this time we are going to be going to talk about Germany on Hitler. I'm calling this episode Descending into Chaos, and that's really what happened after the First World War. Just to remind you, last time we talked about not only Germany, but how other countries in Central Europe were going through anti-Semitic issues, like his neighbor in the South, his own speakers in the form of Georg Ritter von Schonerier, who blamed the Jews and the Catholic Church for pretty much everything going wrong in Austria, and to a small extent, Karl Luger, the mayor of Vienna, was also uh, agitator. Now, we talked about how Germany survived about Bismarck leading the country, and how this anxious new generation, who'd grown up under Bismarck, but never been in power before, and wanted to push what they saw as his goals further along. And that included colonies in Africa and Eastern Europe. This new generation saw that the best way to push ideas was to form various organizations, like the Navy League or the Defense League being the biggest groups by far. I talked about the aims of these organizations, again, to blame the Jews and Social Democrats for all the problems they saw in Germany, and how this time more people started to pay attention and listen, unlike the 1890s, when those ideas first started becoming popular. And I talked about how in August 1914, Germany was one among many of the major powers ready to go to war, and how their early days in the Great War, especially on the Eastern Front, saw a great success, leading to the rise of General Paul von Hindenburg and General Erich Ludendorff, who by 1916 had taken over control of the German government. They pushed the Kaiser to the sidelines. And I mentioned how, because Germans helped get Lenin to Russia, where he began the USSR in November 1917, the greatest fear of communism became reality as communism began to spread into their country, and how this caused Many in Germany support the idea that violent means must be used against the communists. Even this meant they would lose civil liberties. And finally, I mentioned how the sudden collapse on the Western Front surprised many in the government and how they would now have to figure out what to do. So what did they do? Well, in November 1918, most Germans thought that since the war was coming to an end before one Allied soldier had even set foot on German soil, the terms in which the peace be based would be relatively equitable. During the war, the government had talked about how much territory Germany should ask for after they won, and came up with a plan to ask for large parts of Western and Eastern Europe, as well as complete German control over continental Europe. The right went even further with their aims. But that was them not the Allies, and so it came as a complete shock when as Germany prepared to sign an armistice on November 11th, 1918, they were forced to have all German troops withdraw east of the Rhine, forced to surrender the German high seas fleet and all the submarines to the Allies, and forced to repudiate the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Until Germany did this, the Allies would keep the economic blockade of Germany going, which made worse an already dire food supply situation. In fact, the blockade would not be ended until July 1919. Now, most everyone in Germany felt that these terms were unjustified national humiliation. Resentment was widespread, as at the French especially who took actions to enforce the terms. And many in Germany were shocked as well, since not one part, again, not one inch of German soil had been invaded. So why should they be treated this way? And very quickly, senior army officers who refused to take the blame, even though it was theirs to take, they began to spread the story that Germany had been stabbed in the back by enemies at home. Well, who were these enemies? Well, that depends on who you asked, but it's true that everyone from Hindenburg to Ludendorff to Kaiser Wilhelm II, even Frederick Ebert, who we'll be talking about next time, the party leader the Social Democrats, spread the story. The defeat brought about an, an immediate collapse of the political system created by Bismarck in 1870. 
As the war is winding up and it appeared that they were losing, Ludendorff and other members of the Reich leadership had started to ab advocate for a democratization of the imperial German political system. In order that the Western allies, especially the United States led by President Wilder Wilson, would smile on them and give reasonable and favorable peace terms. As a byproduct, Ludendorff made clear that the peace terms were not favorable. Well, he wasn't going to be running the government anyway, and therefore whatever government was, was over the Reich before signing agreement, so the blame could easily pass on to them. October 3rd, 1918, the government passed in the hands of Prince Maximilian of Baden, a noted liberal, but his government was unable to control the navy whose officers attempted to put out to sea to fight one more battle, which they planned to lose. And they planned to go down fighting against the British fleet. Now, not surprisingly, when they got wind of this, the German sailors mutinied, and within days, an uprising spread to civilians, and the Kaiser, as well as all the princes from the King of, the, of Bavaria to the Grand Dukes of Baden, were forced to abdicate. The army simply melted away as armistice papers were signed, and Democrat parties were left to negotiate. I think that's a term. Ah, well, let's just say they negotiated the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Now, as a result of this treaty, Germany lost 10% of its population, 13% of its territory, including Alsace-Lorraine, which is given back to France after 50 years of German control, along the border territories of Eupen, Malmedy, and Morsenet, those three given to Belgium. The Tsarland was looped off from Germany under a mandate that the people would eventually be allowed to vote, if they wanted to, to become part of France or go back to Germany with the hope that the French would win the vote. In order to keep German troops from entering the Rhineland as well, British, French, and for a while American troops were stationed there. The British and French would be there for 10 more years. Northern Schleswig went to Denmark in 1920, Memel went to the new country of Lithuania. A new Polish state was created and Germany lost Posen much of West Prussia, and Upper, Upper Silesia to that country. Danzig was made a free city under the nominal control of the newly formed League of Nations, and in order to give Poland access to the Baltic Sea, a corridor of land separating East Prussia from the rest of Germany was created. All of Germany's overseas colonies were handed over to the League of Nations, which passed them out to the winning allies. Some negotiation. Negotiation is the key here. Now, even though the Habsburg Empire broke into part into the countries of Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia, or became part of the countries of Romania and Poland, Austria was not allowed to become part of Germany again. It had to become its own country, even though politically and economically it wasn't viable. Austria was now cut off, not only from Germany, but from Hungary. Which it, depend, which it had depended on economically for years. Its capital of Vienna, whose population swollen by redundant Habsburg bureaucrats and military administrators, made up a third of its living area. What people on the right fringe been saying for years suddenly made sense to them. And President Wilson, in his 14-point speech stated every nation would be allowed to determine its own future free from interference by others. So, if this applied to Poland, if this applied to Czechoslovakia, if this applied to Yugoslavia, it surely applied to Austria as well, but not to the victorious allies. After all, the allies said to themselves, what had they been fighting for if in the end Germany ended up bigger by 6 million people in a larger part of Europe including one of Europe's greatest cities. Everyone in Austria wanted to be united with Germany, but despite the principle of national self-determination demanding union, the Allies said no. One voice, no. And that condemned Austria for 20 years to be conflict-ridden, crisis-racked existence. Now, one of the biggest gripes the Germans had was Argyll 231, where they were told they were the ones who started the war. They were blamed, even though every other country was ready and willing to go to war in August 1914. 
Another article stated that Kaiser needed to be handed over to the Allies to be tried for war crimes, along with Hindenburg and Ludendorff and really anyone else they could find in arrest. Now, the Kaiser had fled the country. Ludendorff had fled the country. Hindenburg was back on his farm, his Junker estate in Prussia. He wasn't coming back out of it. And while there were some minor trials in Leipzig before a German court, they all failed because most of the German judges did not accept that these charges should have even existed in the first place. 900 war criminals were charged and sent out for trial. Only seven were found guilty. Ten were found innocent. The rest were released quietly, never went to trial. Now, the real purpose of Article 231, however, was so that the Allies could legitimize the punitive financial reparations on Germany in order to compensate the French and Belgians for the damage of four years of war. The Germans had seized over 2 million tons of merchant ships, 5,000 railway en engines, 136,000 coaches, 24 million tons of coal, and a hell of a lot more. The reparations would be paid in gold over a number of years stretching far into the future to keep Germany from also financing the reconstruction of its military might in case these reparations are not enough. The Allies further demanded that the Al German army was to be restricted to 100,000 men, no tanks, no heavy artillery, no conscription, 6 million German rifles, 15,000 airplanes, more than 130,000 machine guns, countless other military equipment was to be destroyed. German Navy was effectively dismantled. They were barred from building any large new ships, no submarines at all. Germany was not allowed to have an air force. These were the terms of peace in 1919. And all of this was greeted by the majority of Germans with incredulous horror. The sense of outrage and disbelief that swept through the upper middle classes was almost universal had an impact on many working class supporters of the moderate Social Democrats as well. Germany had been in great power since 1871. Now suddenly in 1918 it was expelled from those ranks and covered with shame. Versailles was condemned as a dictated peace, unilaterally imposed without the possibility of negotiation. Remember, they did not get to negotiate. Many Germans who had supported the war now resented the victorious allies. Now, in reality, the peace settlement did create for Germany new opportunities to, to be basically head over to East Central Europe. The mighty Habsburg, the mighty Romanov empires, they're gone. They're a small, squabbling, unstable state. So if Germany had just turned its attention east, they could have controlled that area. And it must be acknowledged that if Germany had won the war, the concessions it would have got from the Allies in terms of territory and the reparations would have been much, 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 much worse. The reparations that Germany was saddled with were not beyond what Germany could pay. In reality, it wasn't unreasonable, given the destruction of Belgium and French territory by German occupying armies, perhaps in any other time. These, or really any other peace terms, would have been accepted, but it was, this was 1919. The German nationals were angry. They had been cheated from victory. They weren't going to accept this. And to make matters worse from the German viewpoint, the fact that the Allies had occupied large parts of Western Germany and the Rhineland and the Saar created a widespread resentment and intensified German nationalism in the areas that were affected. The most resentment was toward the French troops stationed in the Tsar. Tsar. Since the French, unlike the British and Americans, banned German patriotic songs, banned German festivals, encouraged separatist move movements in the areas they were occupying, and outlawed radical nationalist groups. An unofficial policy of passive resistance started an area that was aimed at France, but also the German government back in Berlin who had accepted it. And it was a rejection of German democracy for failing to do anything about it. Now, meanwhile, back in the latter stages of the war, war the Pan-Germans, who had been the most supportive of the war in 1914, remember those Pan-Germans? 
they saw it as a fulfillment of their live stream. And they began to realize about 1917 that they needed to make another serious attempt to broaden their base of support in order to put pressure on the government once more. While they talked, <laughs> others moved. And suddenly they were outflanked by a new movement started by Wolfgang Kapp, an ex-civil servant and state manager associated with the business magnate and founder member of the Pan-Germans, Alfred Hugenberg. I told you you'd hear his name, and you will hear it again. Now, Kapp believed that no nationalist movement could succeed without a mass space. And in September of 1917, he created the German Fatherland Party. The German Fatherland Party, whose program adopted planks of the Pan-German platform. This new party soon found itself backed with members of the Pan-Germans and presented itself as above politics and soon teachers, and Protestant pastors, and army officers, and really others had joined. By the fall of 1918, the Fatherland Party had a membership of 1,250,000 members. That looks like a very good figure, but actually it was kind of fudged. The German Fatherland Party double-counted people. In reality, the true number is probably about 445,000. And Camp had all of these Pan-Germans pushed aside because he believed that if they were seen as leaders of the party, it would deter potential supporters from less extreme parts of the political spectrum. And the Fatherland Party also ran into a great deal of opposition from liberals and counted massive suspicion from the government who passed rules banning army officers and civil servants from joining it. And the party found it could not make any headway with the working classes since the Social Democrats blasted the party for its diversive ideology when they tried to turn to discharge war veterans in January 1918, they were met by fights and the police had to come break up the party meetings. Thus the German Fatherland Party, in the end, turned out to be simply another in a long line of failed parties since it refused to go to the fringes, refused to have its members be violent, and showed that like the Pan-Germans, they were spiritually bankrupt. By the fall of 1918, the German Fatherland Party and the Pan-German movement had split apart into sections, no longer with one goal in mind, no longer to be heard. Now what transformed the extreme nationalist scene in the end was not the war itself, but the experience of defeat, the experience of revolution, the experience of armed conflict as the war ended. A powerful role was played by the myth of the front generation of 1914-1918, which believed that only the soldiers who fought in the front lines in the spirit of companionship, comradeship, self-sacrifice, and heroic cause could truly overcome all political, regional, social, and religious differences. Writers like Ernst Jünger, whose book Storm of Seal became a runaway bestseller, celebrated the experience of the fighting man and cultivated the rapid growth of nostalgia for the unity of the wartime years. That's actually an interesting book. I had to read it, um, the sections of it, in grad school. Um, Ernst Jünger actually didn't die until I think the late 90s or early 2000s. He was 102 years old. Anyway, the myth exercised a great influence, especially with the middle classes, from whom hardships shared in reality and spirit with workers and peasants in trenches during the war provide material for nostalgic literary celebration in the years after the war. Many soldiers bitterly resented the outbreak of revolution in 1918. Units coming back from the front would disarm and arrest workers and soldiers' councils in the areas they passed through. Some of these soldiers became more radical because of this, because they felt forgotten by the home front, who they have felt stabbed them in the back while they, while they bravely fought. I must note, however, that such feelings were not universal among the troops, nor did the experience of defeat turn all veterans into political cannon fodder for the right-wing fringe. Large numbers of troops had deserted as the war's ending face of the overwhelming force of the Allies, and they did not show any desire to continue to fight. Millions of working class soldiers simply went back home. They went back to joining the Social Democrats. Some even joined the Communists, which were coming stronger in Germany that fall. 
Some of the Avengers did get involved in politics, but only the state. They did not wish to have anyone go through again the kind of experience they had been subjected to in the Great War. But in the end, ex-soldiers and their resentments would play a crucial part in fostering a climate of violence and discontent after the war was over. And the shock of adjusting to peacetime conditions did push many to the far right. Those who were already politically socialized into conservative and nationalist traditions found that their views made them even more radical. On the left, as well, a new willingness to use violence was conditioned, conditioned by the experience of the war. As distance grew from the war, a myth of the front generation generated a widespread feeling that the veterans who had sacrificed so much for the nation during the war deserved far better treatment than they got. And war veterans felt this way as well. Now, among all the veteran associations, and they were many, among all the veterans associations that formed, the most important was the Steel Helmets, formed on November 13, 1918, by Franz Selt. Okay? He was born June 29, 1882, in Maldenburg. His father owned a factory that produced chemical products and soda water. He apprenticed as a salesman and then went to the University of Brunswick and Griswold, where he studied chemistry. At the university, he was an active member of Student Dueling Corps. Forever after, was proud of the scars he got. In 1908, he took over his father's company after his father died, but he dropped everything to join the German army in August 1914 as an officer. He earned the Iron Cross second and first class. He lost his left arm in the Battle of the Somme, and he was promoted to captain, becoming a frontline reporter. Now, he was distinctively cautious and conservative. He wanted the steel helmets to focus on just being a source of financial support for old soldiers fallen on hard times. But he had to deal with the other leader of the steel helmets, Theodore Dysterberg. Born October 19, 1875, in Darmstadt, Germany, Dysterberg was the son of an army surgeon. He joined the Prussian army as a cadet in 1893. He saw action in China during the Boxer Rebellion in 1900. By 1902, he had risen to become an officer. He held various army posts until the Great War began in August 1914. He served in the Western Front, rose to the rank of lieutenant colonel, and then was transferred to Berlin, where he served in the Prussian War Ministry, as well as serving in Hungary and Turkey. Now, Dice Sturberg was inflexible. He was unbending his political views, and like um, and like Sadat, he was unable to live in a world that did not have the Kaiser in it. But both men did believe that the steel helmets should be above politics. Both men sought to form an organization that would see to it that all in Germany put aside their political differences and embrace the spirit of 1914. The steel helmets denounced the Treaty of Versailles. They demanded its repeal, demanded that the old Reich flag be brought back, and described the economic problems of Germany to the deficiency of living space in the territory in which to work. In order to implement this program, they saw strong leadership was needed. By 1925, they had 300,000 members who were formidable and decidedly mil militaristic presence on the streets, where they often held marches and rallies. Now, for many Germans, just like the steel helmets, the trauma of the Great War and the shock of defeat refused to be healed. After 1918, when Germans talked of peacetime, it wasn't the era they were living in, it was the era before the Great War. Germany failed to make the transition from wartime to peacetime after 1918. It stayed on a continued war footing, a war with itself and war with the rest of the world. As the shock of the Treaty of Versailles united virtually every part of the political spectrum and the grim determination to overthrow its central provisions, restore lost territories, and the repayment and the payment of reparations, and reestablish Germany as the major power in Central Europe once more. 
When the Great War legitimized violence to the degree that not even Bismarck had ever done. Before the war, Germans are widely different and bitterly opposing political police have been able to talk about the differences without resorting to violence. After the Great War, things were entirely different. The changed climate can be seen in the Reichstag, where debate became shouting matches and each side showed open contempt for each other and the chair was unable to keep order. And far worse was the situation in the streets. All sides had armed squads of thugs. Fights were common, assassinations often used. Those who carried out these acts of violence were not only ex-soldiers, but men in the late teens and twenties who had been too young to fight in the war, and for whom civil violence had become a way of showing that they too could be frontline soldiers. Before long, all political parties had their own armed and uniformed squads. The task was of each squad is to guard meetings, impress the public by marching in a military manner through the streets, and intimidate, beat up, and maybe even if the leaders call for it, murder members of paramilitary units associated with other political parties. The relationship between parties and organizations was often fraught with tension, and paramilitary organizations had a degree of independence, but their political coloring is usually clear enough. For instance, the Steel Helmets, supposedly just a veterans organization, would often parade through the streets and beat up rival groups as they became closer to the far right after 1925. And that year they banned Jews from membership, even though Jewish veterans needed their support like all veterans. The Nationalists had the Fighting League. The Social Democrats had the Reich banner, Black, Red, Gold. The Communists had the Red Front Fighters League. And the far right had smaller combat leagues shading off the illegal conspiratorial groups which did the party's bidding through violence and revenge killings. Bands of uniformed men marching through the streets and fighting each other soon became a common part of the Weimar Republic. The German Revolution in late 1918 and early 1919 did not resolve the conflicts that had been building up in the country in the final years of the war. Few were entirely satisfied with the results of the revolution. On the extreme left, the band of revolutionaries led by Karl Liebeneck and Rosa Luxemburg saw on the events in November 1918 the chance to create a socialist state run by the workers and soldiers councils that had sprung up all over Germany after the imperial system died. They saw Lenin as their model, and they pressed on their plans for another revolution to finish the work that they had started. Now, the Social Democrats feared that the revolutionaries might start the kind of red terror at that time taking place in Russia, which would kill them off. And so, afraid for their lives and conscious of the need to prevent Germany from falling into anarchy, they agreed to recruit heavily armed paramilitary bands made up of war veterans and younger men known as the Freikorps to put down any and all revolutionary uprisings. Early on in 1919, the extreme left staged a poorly organized uprising in Berlin, and the Freikorps, aided on by the Social Democrats, reacted with unprecedented violence and brutality. Liebenich and Luxembourg were kidnapped and murdered. Any revolutionary scene was either mown down or quickly arrested and shot throughout Germany, where they appeared to be a threat. Now, these events would leave a permanent legacy of bitterness and hatred on the political left, which was made worse by another major outbreak of violence in the spring of 1920, when a Red Army of workers formed by the Social Democrats and the Communists to defend civil liberties in their industrial region of the Ruhr in the face of an attempted right-wing coup in Berlin called the Cap Putsch, Wolfgang Cap is back, started to advance more radical political demands. Now, once the attempted coup had been put down by a general strike, the Red Army was put down by units of the Fry Corps, backed by the Social Democrats, who had started the whole thing in the first place, and the regular army in what amounted to regional civil war. Well over a thousand members of the Red Army were slaughtered, most of them prisoners shot by trying to escape. Now, these two events doomed any chance that the communists and social democrats make common cause. 
But the 1918 revolution also infected the far right, who saw that such extreme violence had been made legitimate and encouraged by the moderate social democrats against the left. Why not use the same method against social democrats? So the Fry Corps turned on their masters. Many leaders of Fry Corps officers who had served in the trenches, they believed the stab in the back legend. They believed that the social democrats had been the one who had done the stabbing. So they now started to breathe fire on the Reds who were unhuman rats and the poisonous flood that was pouring over Germany, thus needing extermination. Army officers and many right-wing politicians brought into this line of reasoning and scores of young students who had missed the war now flocked to join the Fry Corps and the far-right parties. They saw all socialists and Democrats as November criminals and November traitors who had stabbed the army in the back, who had forced the Kaiser to abdicate, who had signed the armistice, who had signed the Treaty of Versailles. In fact, many politicians who, politicians who had signed the Treaty of Versailles soon realized they had signed their own death warrants on that day. As Fry Corps members formed secret assassination squads to root out and kill those traitors in Germany. Among the victims was Democrat politician Walter Rathenau, the foreign minister of Germany, killed on June 24, 1922. Leading socialist Hugo Haas, shot on October 8, 1919, died November 7, 1919. And Senate Party Deputy Matthias Ersberger, murdered on August 26, 1921. It only gets worse. In this atmosphere of national trauma, political extremism, violent conflict, and revolutionary upheaval, the National Socialist Democratic Party, Workers' Party, would be born. But before we talk about the party and the rise, its rise to power, I'll spend a few lectures looking at the weakness of Weimar, looking at the ruinous inflation crisis of 1923, looking at the culture wars in the 1920s and the ideas of who was fit and not fit to be German. But soon, however, my friends, those who have come here to find out more about the Nazis and Hitler will be rewarded. But until then, stay thirsty. More knowledge is coming.